Welcome back to Earth, ladies and gentlemen. It's a chance for us to explore some of the issues and ask some of your questions, show some of your photographs. Also a chance for us probably to give you a sense of what it's like working in the show. A lot of you are asking what's it like behind the scenes. So we thought we'd make this little film. Now I'm here by the Lubbell Telescope at Jodrell Bank. And at the start of each day before every show, I just like to come out here and make sure that everything is working like it should be. Yeah, all good. So come with me as I take you on an exclusive behind the scenes tour of Stargazing Live. It's from here that the movements of that amazing dish behind me are precisely monitored. But my favorite bit is all these buttons. There's loads of buttons and you just sort of want to go like that and press them all. But you're not allowed to do that. You'd well get done if you were to do that. So I'm not doing it. This is a room that's like full of tellies. And pretty soon, I'm gonna be on all of them. Having that. One of the wonders of lunchtime is when I do some shopping and get some things to recreate the diversity of our solar system. Like Mercury would be a Tic Tac just by the sun. You've got Venus and our Earth. And then next to them, Mars and Malteser, Jupiter, which is this watermelon, and Saturn. You've got the asteroid belt, which we're gonna recreate with a bag of rebels, like that. Some hundreds and thousands, that's the galaxy just there, loads of it. And that is why I love lunchtime. Astronomy allows us to contemplate profound and very big things. The heat death of the universe will see its gradual dissipation and ultimate demise. But the number of years until this happens is a huge number, so huge, I need help to express it because it's 10,000 billion, 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 billion years. It's like loads. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, John Coleshaw. <laughs> <laughs> so, so John, the only imperfection in his impression is that his hair is not grey enough. <laughs> he, needs to, he needs to get a greyer wig. I, I, I can spot with many it. imperfections. You look like you, and you look like the bass guitarist from a Beatles tribute band. <laughs> um, <laughs> the number one imperfection I can spot. No, for you, this, this is not a good look. Uh, so say, thank you very much, John, for joining us. We'll have a word about the time you had in the field. Also, we have our experts with us now. We obviously, Tim O'Brien still with us. We have uh, Dr. Lucy Green. Thank you very much. Dr. Andrew Ponson, who we met briefly, and then we got rid of you. I never said goodbye. <laughs> Apologies for that. Okay. We've used you. Go. Uh, so thank you for coming back. It's very, very kind of you. We will have questions. John, we always give somebody a gift. You deserve more than anyone oh, for that effort. Okay. Uh, this is meteorite wine. Uh, it is a Chilean, I believe, a Chilean Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, feel free to pop the cork on that, by the very way. Much so. uh, and uh, what they do is during the aging process, they place a meteor into the cast. I see. Yeah. And so well, as Patrick Moore says, have a drink. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we can pass it on. I think some of the people who've been out, how's it been out in the, uh, the cold? Has it been all right? Yeah. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll pass them some of to you, uh, you know. And they make us claim it's like tasting the birth of the universe. Go, are you going to give us a taste? I certainly am. Do please. Here we are. Right, who's coldest out here? That's like amazing. Yeah. Not yeah. too young. Sort of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Meteorite wine. <laughs> Meteorite wine, yes. Absolutely. I'm not a kick. Entirely convinced. Now, you are an avid astronomer already. We're, yeah. we're talking to you already. Uh, yes. How's it been, by the way, has it helped to have you know, a few experts around you just to show you some of the... Oh. Yeah, it's, it's always a great thing when you get a, a great group of astronomers mm -hmm. together and everybody helps each other out and everybody helps with each other's telescopes and so on. There's quite a nice sort of communal feel. It is that. quite a convivial thing. Yes, it's like, it is they all seem like a very happy group of people that we have mm. doing this. How, have you got wine? Because I haven't <laughs> somehow in the great shakedown here. <laughs> I've been there for the bottle you that I'm supposed to drink from that. by the neck. All right. Uh, <laughs> lousy does this look. Uh, OK. <laughs> it seems like a good time to go to a question from a 12-year-old. Great question, 12-year-old. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, and the question we're going to first was from Alex Worthington, is the first person who sent us in the question. And the question is Could a black hole one day appear near Earth and suck us in? I'm going to turn it to you first. Thing. Well, no. It won't stuck us in. But yes, it, they could appear. I mean, there's a, there's an idea, there are theories that there are things called primordial black holes, which are very small subatomic black holes. You have just have a drink there. Uh, which, which, which could have been around since the Big Bang. So there could be 
very small black holes around here now. They could be floating through this room now. How long and you might wouldn't it take them to develop into something bigger and well, more dangerous, they, perhaps? They, they, they won't. I mean, the thing about a black hole is that just because it collapses and it's a black hole, if you're in orbit, if the sun became a black hole now, and I think the radius would be, what, be about, about three, three kilometres. Three kilometres, yes. Yeah. So you, it's not a so, cosmic hoover. You wouldn't get Yeah, you could squash in. it down and you wouldn't notice. The Earth would still continue to orbit around it in exactly the same way. So it's kind of a misnomer that they just hoover up everything that's around them. If the sun did turn into a black hole, it'd get dark in eight minutes, it'd get very cold and we'd all die, but we wouldn't get sucked into yeah. it. Yeah, so look on the bright side. Ding. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have <laughs> apocalyptic <laughs> prediction on the series so far? Uh, do, do you have any, anything that, to add? Yeah, I mean, the, ti the tiny black holes also evaporate very quickly yeah. through Hawking radiation. It's faster for the small black holes than for the really big black holes that we deal with in astronomy. But by quickly, what do you mean? Uh, now you're putting me on the spot. Uh, for the, the, uh, you're talking about fractions of a second for, for the very really small, small ones. I mean, people were talking about uh, CERN creating yeah. black holes, as I guess you're. They were mad aware. people. Yeah, yeah but, but, go, but, but, the, but the they were already watching ITV or Big Brother. <laughs> yes. He here. drives them away. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, not, it's not mad that years. it could create black holes, right? But, but they would evaporate very quickly, so they, they wouldn't cause any problems. Yeah. You both said the words, if the sun became a black hole. The sun is not going to become a black hole. It doesn't have enough. It isn't large. It's, no, it's not it. massive enough, so you need to be several times the mass of the sun to, to be able to end the days of the star collapsing down with gravity unable to stop the collapse and then take it down into the singularity. So the sun, the sun's not massive enough. It will die in a much calmer, more sedate way, throw off its outer layers and become a planetary nebula. Heather Steele asks, are black holes like wormholes in Star Trek? Um, I... Well, I think there, there, are, there are solutions of Einstein's equations, which indeed have that property. I think they have to spin. Is that right? I think spinning black holes. Can yeah, I mean, we, those. I think we don't know. It's probably yeah. the answer to yeah. that one. But so they're allowed. <laughs> Wormholes yeah. no, are allowed. They, they are allowed. There's been no evidence mm -hmm. for them, though. So, yeah. so we're not certain that they really do exist, wormholes. You hear them a lot in science fiction, for example. Yeah, yeah they might do. Yes. Well, I, I, think should, should, <laughs> should, I, I think it's. I don't think it's clear if you have something that's formed in the real universe from, say, a star collapsing. Mm. I think under those circumstances, it seems pretty unlikely that you would end up with a wormhole. So, it, it, it's more like the mathematical solutions which have these wormholes in, and probably real black holes don't. Do we? Can we get to Skype? By the way, now do we have some, some people sitting on Skype? Because people have emailed us questions, we've emailed them back. As far as I know, I can get to Henry. Uh, who's here, he's age six with his mum, Sally. Hello, you two. Um, what question Hello. do you have for us? Okay. <laughs> what would happen if a star nebulae planet or if the sun went through a black hole? And how do black holes work? Thank you. <laughs> nice work, Henry. Very good. It's a brilliant question. I mean, so, so we, we already spoke about what had happened. Nothing had happened except, as Tim says, it would go dark and eventually it get very cold and we'd be in some trouble. But the Earth and the solar system would remain the same. But how do black holes work, I think, is a fascinating question because the answer is that we don't know. And do you have anything to add? Um, I think the thing about the, the, w explaining why we wouldn't suddenly get sucked into the black hole is that if you could somehow get a giant pair of hands and crush the sun down to about six kilometres across, it would turn into a black hole, but its mass wouldn't change. And it's its mass that, that gives you the force of gravity which determines how, how we orbit around it. So in that sense, we, we wouldn't notice if the, if, if the sun turned into a black hole, I guess. Mm. Now, there was, a, uh, there was an idea, um, a science fiction idea, this was, mm. that you could use the pull of a black hole like a turbine that you could, and you could emit waste into it, let's say, it would, it would pull the waste, and that would turn the, the wheel that it was on. Is there any way of harnessing something like this, the, the pull of something like a black hole? It's, a, it's, it's not obvious. <laughs> technologically, yeah. technologically, it seems pretty unlikely. But on the other hand, we certainly see in the universe um, that black holes are an amazingly efficient way of generating energy, uh, more efficient than stars. Mm. If, you, if you chuck some mass into a black hole, you get something like 10% of E equals mc squared back. That, that's far more efficient than nuclear fusion. And that's from that radiation that we see, uh, yep. that we detect the x-rays and the radio waves from that spiralling matter as it falls in. Matt Hedger asks, what is the largest black hole that we know of anywhere? Oh, yeah. there's a, several billions of times the mass of the sun, I think. Yeah, um, so these supermassive black holes at the heart of galaxies that you're speaking see, about. See, we talk about, we've, we've talked about, we've only touched on it briefly, that there are two kinds of black holes, because there are, there are ones which are like the sun collapsing in. How are supermassive black holes, are they like an order of magnitude or a number of order of magnitudes greater 
than a solar black hole. Yeah, yeah, many, many times more massive. So you've got to have much more material coming in and falling across the event horizon to build up the mass of that black hole, which is why you see them at the centre of galaxies where there's lots and lots of material available to come and did in. They begin, did they begin as ordinary black holes and just grow in size? Is that what happened? There, there's a bit of a puzzle, actually, because we have some ideas about how black holes might uh, originate in the early universe, but they tend to be relatively small uh, solar mass type black holes. And uh, it's pretty hard to see how you get from there up to uh, a supermassive uh, million solar mass black holes. Once you've got the supermassive million solar mass black holes, then you can merge those and carry on making bigger ones. But it's hard. We heard uh, Event Horizon use that mm. term, Lucy. Now, what's an Event Horizon? What's the difference between that and a singularity? You hear this described around black yeah, holes. Yeah, so the singularity is, is the mathematical description of what a black hole is. So once you collapse all the matter down, that's what the, the equations tell you you get. But then considering how close you have to get to be sucked in, so coming back to this idea that black holes are cosmic hoovers, you know, if the sun, as we've said, turned into a black hole, you wouldn't get sucked in, but you would if you got to the event horizon. So that's the distance at which it's the point of no return. So as you get closer to an object, the gravitational pull increases, increases, increases. And when you get to the event horizon, so it's almost like on in. I'm going to have to, to throw it because we're getting, as well as Crescent, we're also getting loads and loads of photographs, and we're going to go to Mark and see which is the best of the photographs he's received today. Well, welcome back to our special Stargazer space. Um, as you can see, it's a representation, not to scale, I hasten to add, of the observable universe. And you've been sending in some fantastic images. Some of them are just on the board already. If you've not sent your pictures yet, send them in. Follow the link on the screen now, um, and we look forward to getting them. But for tonight's pictures, we've got some quite incredible ones. I'll start up this end with a picture by... Robert Ince, who was taken um, by the, well, the Kielda Star Party. Now, Robert took this picture of a galaxy called Sarah's Galaxy back in August this year, and it was using a 5-inch refracting telescope, and it was an image taken with a red, green, and blue filter of the galaxy, and then combined yeah. back together to show you that really quite amazing picture of the galaxy. You can see the dust lane, so it's a really superb image. The second image that we have tonight, if I could prize the black tape apart without dropping all the cards as well, and also putting on upside down, was taken at the roll light stones, which of course we used in our, our light pollution film. And that picture was taken yeah. by Mel Gig, and it shows the rotation of the Earth nicely in the star trail. So the camera is just pointed at the sky um, and allows the, the, the stars to trail across the, uh, the, the camera. Beautiful image there. And then finally, and I think this is actually my favourite picture, um, is a picture of the sun with a jet. I should put it over by the sun with a jet aircraft passing just in front. It brings a whole new meaning to solar jets. Um, and it uh, was taken with a solar telescope, which means you can get a very good, clear image of the sun safely. So keep the pictures coming in, um, and hopefully you might see them on the board tomorrow night. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Mark. Now, apparently we're getting nothing but emails questioning your hardline stance with regard to UFOs. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I think the big question about uh, UFOs is that there's a, something called the Fermi Paradox, um, which I think is very forceful and very powerful. And it, so the question is, why aren't they here, rather than why haven't, uh, why haven't we seen any is a mystery. And the reason is that the galaxy is so old, let's say it's 11, 12 billion years old, there are so many star systems, 200 billion, 300, 400 billion star systems, that it's very difficult to understand why there isn't a civilization somewhere that is more advanced than us, such that it should have colonized the galaxy, or at least it should have sent space probes out all over the Milky Way galaxy. There's nothing in the laws of physics that says that within give us a million years and we don't destroy ourselves, then we should have been able to explore the galaxy. So the question is, why don't we see these alien probes? Why don't we see the aliens? And it's very difficult, actually, to explain why that is the case. So that's called the Fermi Paradox. My stance, though, so, my, so I wouldn't be surprised yes. at all Your typical if a UFO landed over there. Your stance on, However, on people having I, fun I, I, and I, just enjoying I, I themselves. Think that, no, I think that they're either going to appear or they're not. Yeah. If they want to come and be seen, then they will land and they will be big things and we'll see them. If they want to hide, then they won't mess it up a little bit. They won't abduct <laughs> 150,000 American farmers, fail to wipe the memory of six of them, who will then go and write a book and become very famous. That, they wouldn't mess up in that, that way. That's my view. That is intergalactic fighting talk. Does anyone, does anyone disagree? We should go around the panel. Well, does anyone disagree with that analysis? Absolutely not. No. Agreement. 
I, I think that uh, aliens might be gently watching us the way that David Attenborough observes penguins. Just leaving us <laughs> I, I, That's the presumption of that is that penguins don't observe David Attenborough as much as David Attenborough. <laughs> David Attenborough, yeah, yeah. Attenborough doesn't abduct the penguins and no. stick things into that, them. That, that, not that, 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 <laughs> that, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, may I, can I bring it back on to more, you know, celestial matter? Sorry. The, uh, it's okay, you can drink while I'm asking the question. Uh, John Butcher from Amersham, do you think there'll ever be a time when we can see black holes? Well, it's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I find this a really interesting question. So I, I think there may well be, and actually there's lots of simulations done at the moment to, to give us an understanding actually of what do we need to look for in, able to, in order to be able to see these invisible objects. So you can see emission from hot material that forms a, an accreting disk around them, but if you just had a black hole with no accreting material and no X-ray emission, what would you look for? And in that case, you'd be looking for a shadow, a black shadow against the starry background. And the simulations have shown us that the distortions in the distribution of stars because of the effect of the black hole. And even if the black hole's spinning, the black shadow would change its shape and get distorted. Mm. So we theoretically, we understand some of what, what we actually need to look for, should we be able to have telescopes that can see these small enough regions and of space. It, and in fact, there is a, there's a project, that, there's a meeting actually tomorrow in the States that's uh, discussing a new project called the Event Horizon Telescope, which is, which is uh, intended to do exactly that. And what they're doing is looking at using a, a network of up to 50 telescopes spread across the whole planet, um, working together, looking at the black hole at the centre of our Milky Way that we discussed earlier. Um, and they're using telescopes that, that work millimetre wavelengths, so they're basically like radio telescopes with, with looking at light with wavelengths of about a millimetre. And with that, they've got the sharpness of view to hope to see this shadow and be the first to directly image a black hole. And, and do you think that in the future, because black holes do emit, we think, so the Hawking radiation, the thing that Stephen Hawking is probably most famous for predicting. Um, so that's why they, if that's true, they can evaporate away. Mm -hmm. So there is a gradual stream, we think, of subatomic particles from a black hole. Do you think in the future that we may be sensitive enough to see Hawking radiation directly? I think, again, it depends on the size of the black hole. So these very massive ones that live for very long time scales, I think are very, very cold, whereas when they get smaller, or rather as they, as they emit the radiation, they lose mass and then they get smaller and that process accelerates and they get hotter and hotter. Mm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe... I think realistically, you know, it's, it's very unlikely we could ever detect Hawking mm. radiation from anything astrophysical, but one of the really exciting frontiers of, of astrophysics is gravitational wave detection. One way you could, you could detect... Uh, black holes is because they emit, especially when they're merging, something mm. called gravitational waves, and people have projects to try and detect those. They're ripples in Einstein's space time. Well, Tim showed us the, the double black, the potential double black hole system, mm. which would be just such a system. Mm. So we're looking, yeah, we're looking for those ripples that would spread through the universe from these two masses whipping around each other before they sort of yep. collide to make one big mm. black hole. So that could happen in the next ten years. And could there be the faintest possibility to all of these fanciful ideas that if you were to pass through the centre of a black hole or a wormhole, you somehow email yourself into some <laughs> other dimension or back in time? <laughs> Is that just for science fiction or science fiction, or could that? I, I think it comes back to, to what we were saying earlier that you know, the mathematical solutions have loads of weird properties but if you, if you look mm -hmm. at a, a messy collapsing star the complicated astrophysics means that all of these very nice mathematical properties go away and I, I honestly don't think we know what, what mm. an astrophysical black, black hole is, is really like. Well when we're on the subject of science fiction or science facts that may be the, the perfect point to pass over to uh, Patrick Moore with exactly that kind of question. Science, science facts or science fiction? fiction. Take a look at this remarkable picture. It shows a piece of aerogel. Now, has aerogel ever been used in space? Tell me. Science fact or science fiction? OK, the question Sir Patrick was asking was about aerogel. Are you familiar with aerogel? I'm not going to say anything to that. No, you need to say you're familiar with it. With, with I'm familiar with it. I mean, it's been, it's been used in a space missions, as Sir Patrick mm. said. And it, you can use it as a particle detector, detecting something called Cherenkov radiation, where particles can pass through the aerogel faster than light can pass and through the exactly aerogel. And what exactly is it, by the way? We're, we're discussing this. Ah. Mm -hmm. Highly well, dangerous and very it's unsafe. No, it's very <laughs> difficult to open, as the so main <laughs> thing in aerogel is. It's incredibly so it's big, big, big sign saying uh, open, but we don't There we go. <laughs> Lovely. Have to do there we that. are. Yeah. I've heard it described as liquid smoke. Oh. And very e breaks relatively easily, I'm no, just saying. Is, uh, <laughs> is that, like, Would you like was that expensive that very or important to anything? <laughs> Am I just... Oh, wow. Oh, that's, that's, really that's great. Do you want to see it? Oh, my God. <laughs> Here we go. Here's the other half. And then the Back. two of you are Here. united for eternity. Uh, yeah. 
Look yeah, the question is, has it been used in space? I think you've sort of answered that question, really, haven't you? Have I done it again? Yeah, you have. <laughs> well, 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 you've answered the question. Me. All right, so we say science fact. Oh, uh, Sir Patrick, is it science fact? <laughs> oh, God. Yes, this time you're right. Energy has been used in space to capture comet dust because it is so incredibly low density it picks things up. So there it is, and nothing else quite like it. Now, think about aerogel. It's an incredibly low-density foam. It also apparently shares one trait. Well, I'll find if I squish my hand into it and, and rub it around. What trait is that? It's hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. So it, it will repel water, so your hands should not get wet. My hands should get wet. dip it in water okay, when That's covered in aerogel. This is very, very... I can't fathom this. It's almost bizarre, right? Now, my hand is covered in... Yeah. Well, that is oh, bizarre. Look at that. Done it. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely dry. Bone dry. Do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. This is amazing. The great thing is, it's completely impossible to wash off or remove. Oh. So, hand goes in into water. You can't actually feel any water. You can feel the temperature around it, but not wetness per se. And then your hand comes out completely dry. That's how James Bond does it. Very good. Uh, ridiculous. Uh, this, every question of these is really huge. If large masses, this is what Andy from Liverpool asks, actually, yeah, your hand feels really weird, and I get the impression this stuff <laughs> is just going to be on me in some shape or form forever. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Must make a mental note not to go to the toilet immediately after the <laughs> show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if large masses are drawn to one another, does that mean that eventually black holes will swallow everything up? I suppose, theoretically, if things got close enough to a black hole you could I don't think there's um, but they don't keep expanding do they do, uh, over time do black holes get larger or smaller uh, the event horizon will get larger if you have more material going into it but I don't think there's an upper limit on the mass that a black in, hole in, can in the very long term the, the whole evolution of the universe is going to be taken over by dark energy or at least we think so we don't fully understand it but that is going going to push the, all galaxies in the universe further and further apart so even if all the material in the galaxies on very very long time scales could fall in to the mm. black holes, then those black holes will be further and further apart and they will have lots of time to radiate yeah. Hawking radiation and, and just evaporate. And evaporate. Uh, it slowly will evaporate. If they, once they stop eating, then they evaporate down. And presumably the scales between different galaxies are sufficient that they're not going to meet up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think Andrew's like absolutely right that things are not close enough in the, ga in the universe to come together. But, I mean, theoretically, these well, black what holes is, can keep going. What is really interesting here is you've heard the, the boundaries of physics expressed beautifully. We mentioned dark energy. We, we have no idea, it's true to say, I think, what dark energy is. It looks like over 70% of the energy in the universe is taken up, uh, making the universe expand more quickly, so accelerating its expansion. It's an absolute mystery. What happens in black holes is a mystery. We're talking about Hawking radiation as if it's a, a fact, it's theoretically there, it's quite well established theoretically, but we don't know whether black mm. holes will evaporate. And, so oh, so, and so dark matter and dark, dark energy, any shortening of what they are or how we could possibly interact with them? I mean, I'll pass dark energy on to the cosmologists because it's difficult, but I'll say dark matter, <laughs> it, it, that is potentially in the realm of particle physics. So the Large Hadron Collider may make particles called supersymmetric particles, so a whole new set of particles, almost like a mirror world, if you like, but heavier than these particles. And the lightest one of those is predicted to be stable and it's a candidate for dark matter so it could be the universe is full of supersymmetric particles and we may discover those next year the year after us and the large hadron collider dark energy though mm. what is dark, dark energy mm. dark energy it only behaves like anti-gravity i mean it was a complete shock i think when it was discovered really in 1998 because we've been looking at the universe expanding and what we were expecting with all these clusters of galaxies will be being pulled back together slightly by their gravity and so the expansion will be slowing down and what we found was the expansion was speeding up um, so there's this we did we didn't know what was causing that we didn't already didn't know what dark matter was so we coined the term dark energy so it's something else we didn't know yeah. mm -hmm. brian heath asked by the way could the black holes hold all this missing dark matter no they no. couldn't be the source of that. <laughs> no. I mean, there, there have been experiments to, to check for this with something called microlensing. So if, if the galaxy was full of small little black holes holding all the, the missing matter, we'd be able to, to see that basically by, by staring at stars and seeing them twinkle in a similar way to, to the, what the Planet Hunters experiment is doing. But it would have a, a, a different uh, signal to what you see when you get a planet. They would twinkle because the black hole would pass in front of the star and uh, pull the light 
around it and, and actually make the star brighter for a, a brief moment. Mm -hmm. How are you doing there, John? Are you holding yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking <laughs> dark matter and dark energy. It sounds very sinister. Yeah, is I think it does make it sound like a Bond villain here. <laughs> yeah, it's it nice does. to that you could harness, you know, going to cause... Is it, is it happy dangerous? matter? Well, yes. Happy I mean, energy. <laughs> uh, as, as, as we saw in, in the show, that, I mean, far from dangerous, dark matter is it's probably what? the reason that we're here, because I, I suppose it's with our simulations as they are at the moment, there wouldn't be galaxies without the dark matter to see them. James Bush asked, given that there are so many stars in the universe, do you think that out there somewhere, someone's watching their own stargazing and looking at us? If the universe is infinite in extent, then yes. Really? We, do you thought it Well, we can only see a bit of the universe. We call it the observable universe. It's the, yeah. If we sort of imagine us here, then there's a sort of sphere around us uh, fr from which light's had time to reach us since the Big Bang. And so that, that's the edge of the observable universe. Beyond that, we know there's more universe. Uh, we don't, don't know whether that goes on forever or not. Yeah. If it went on forever, there'd definitely be more Brian Coxes, more than two of them. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, there already are two. And if they stand too close to you, they make sure they're evaporating. We've got you, uh, yeah, the, uh, I know, it's weird. Uh, sorry. OK, one of the things we really want you to do, obviously, is go out and see what's up in the sky above your heads. And to help you, that mark has made another one of his star casts. Look in the south straight after the show tonight and hunt for the three stars in a row that make up Orion's belt. A little closer to the horizon, you may be able to make out some more bright objects close together pointing down. These make up Orion's sword. If the sky is dark and clear enough, in the middle of the sword you can see what looks like a fuzzy star. This is actually the Orion Nebula, an area where new stars are forming. And still in the constellation of Orion, you can see a star that's at the other end of its life cycle. In the top left corner is the red supergiant Betelgeuse. If you can get a good view of this star, you'll see that it does look slightly red. Betelgeuse is in the process of dying and will one day explode and go supernova. And if you look back up beyond Orion, there's more to find. At the very top of the constellation of Taurus is a tiny, closely packed group of stars. It's a star cluster known as the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. The reason they're so close is that they all formed from the same gas cloud. On a much larger scale, look to the west and you'll be looking towards our nearest galaxy, Andromeda. It's above the top star in the square of Pegasus. To the naked eye, it will look like a hazy smudge, but it's actually bigger than our galaxy. And if you're lucky enough to live in an area with truly dark skies, before the moon rises around 3am, try spotting our galaxy, the Milky Way. It's a dense arc of stars running northwest to southeast and passing through the W shape of Cassiopeia and taking in Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Through the night, it gradually sinks towards the horizon, setting around 4am, just after the moon comes up. Now, Mark has also recorded audio guides, which you can download off the website. There's so much information there. How are we doing on the um, Planet Hunters? Well, I've just heard we've had over half a million analyses done, which is, is unbelievable. So we keep doing it. I mean, we're gonna, I think we're going to find planets, but half a million. Let's make it a million by the end of the show. John, have you enjoyed the night here? Absolutely wonderful. You've seen stars? You've got yes, indeed. It was Thanks as well night. to the Liverpool and Macclesfield uh, Astronomy Club. Thank you very much for coming in. Mm -hmm. To our experts, a pleasure to have you here. We'll see some of you again, I know, tomorrow. What are we doing tomorrow? But John, was it wonderful? It was amazing and astonishing and truly amazing. Tomorrow we're looking at those exoplanets. We're going to see the result of those analyses that you've all done. We're going to do a bit more of aliens and... 8pm tomorrow night. See you then.